is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Romans 8, 26 through 30. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified those who he justified, he also glorified. Romans chapter 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10, 9-13 If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Psalm chapter 9, 9 through 12. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord, who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Proverbs 3, 1 through 12. My son, do not forget my teaching. Praise the Lord, everybody. Glad you can make it with us today. And uh, so happy that you are 
able to spend some time with us. Sorry. Um, just to let you know, just real quick, I don't know if uh, you folks like or heard of uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina, um, but we were planning a special, uh, I guess you'd call it a Christmas Eve special. So we're praying that you're going to be able to make it with us for Christmas Eve in South Carolina. And uh, we want to invite you. Of course, we're not going to physically go there, but a good pastor friend of mine, Pastor Len Stubbs, has invited us all to join him on Facebook for Christmas Eve service. And so I hope you'll be looking forward to that. Uh, I think you're going to be really blessed. It's going to be a good time. Praise God. As you know, we're going through something called the alphabet of God. You're not going to be able to see it too well. But today we're going to be talking about the dream maker. God is the dream maker. We've gone through the letter A, B, C. Now today is the letter D. We're going to be talking about the dream maker. And so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are here with us. We thank you, Father, that you never leave us, that you never forsake us. God, we thank you. For the word of God that is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, thank you that your word goes down deep and it brings healing and it brings comfort, conviction, correction, whatever is needed. Lord, we thank you for the powerful word of God. And Lord, we're asking that your word would go forth today through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not in a demonstration of the flesh, but in the power of the Holy Ghost. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. It was around October, don't know which week it was, of 2003, that Carolyn and I discovered that we were going to have a child. The doctors gave us a due date of June 1st. We were going to have a summer baby, and we were just absolutely, utterly excited, as any parent who's gone through this knows. Uh, a number of months passed, and uh, we were given yet another surprise when we were told that the little child there was going to be a girl. Carolyn said that when she looked over, when the news was given to me and she looked over, that I completely turned white and that I was about to faint. And she was probably right. I was just so excited that we were going to have a little girl. Just my heart was bubbling over with joy. Then came the new year, 2004, a couple months into it, I want to say it was around February 2004, my wife then had a dream. And in the dream, we were in the hospital. And she was in the delivery room. We were both actually in the delivery room. I was standing by her side. And she asked the question, what day is it? And I told her, it's May 12th. Now, you have to remember, the doctors told us that this child was going to be born in the summer, June, maybe June 1st, maybe a little bit later. And now Carolyn had this dream. And in this dream, it was very specific that she was going to give birth to a child, to our daughter, on May 12th. Well, as you can imagine, we kind of put that on the back burner of our minds. We're trying to figure out if this is God, if this is something supernatural, is this too much pizza? You know, sometimes that happens. Um, and of course, when she went to work, she started telling her co-workers at the bank about this dream. And immediately, they started making bets. Some were saying, she's not going to give birth on May 12th. Others were saying, she is. They were making these bets. But we had a more important thing that we had to accomplish. And that was trying to figure out the name of this little girl. So we went to the Lord and we were praying and I tell you, after a couple weeks, I came out with a name that I thought, oh, this is from the Lord for sure. We're going to name this little girl Emanuela Fortunata Di Giorgio. <laughs> Just, it's a little Italian. It's not that, it, to me, it was normal. Emanuela Fortunata Di Giorgio. I was stuck on that name. My wife was saying, eh, it's a little too much. And so we started praying again. And was reading through the scriptures and came across this name, Abigail. Abigail was a very intelligent, wise woman, later married King David. And uh, so we thought Abigail, Abigail in the Hebrew, literally means the joy of my father or my father rejoices. 
and we talked about it and it stuck. So we said, okay, that's going to be the name of our little girl. She's going to be called Emmanuel. And then May 12th came. Carolyn, I believe, went to work. I don't remember if she was home or not. And we waited in the morning, anticipating something was going to happen. Nothing. The afternoon, nothing. And that night, I don't recall if it was her or I who cooked some spaghetti. And I was fumbling through the channels. And we were eating this thing. And suddenly, I hear this moan. And I look over at Carolyn, and she's holding her stomach, and she's in pain. And I thought, oh Lord, this doesn't look good. And uh, it started to intensify and intensify to the point where I thought, we've got to get you to the hospital. So with the help of a, a woman now who is ready to give birth and screaming, so we think she's ready to give birth and screaming, and uh, my fortunate uh, 1997 Ford Explorer, you know, a trip from our house to St. Barnabas normally takes about 31 minutes, but that day... Uh, it was a little like doing about 120 to 140. We got there. Uh, boy, I tell you, when I was on the parkway, I just kept flashing lights. Everybody was moving. Not one cop in sight. Just kept going forward. We got there in about 20 minutes, give or take a few seconds. And when we got there, um, rushed into the hospital. Uh, some doctors were on call. They didn't really know what to do. And they said, uh, we're going to go in, you know, do we have your approval? I said, absolutely, but I have to be in the operating room. So I walked in with them. They performed the C-section. And amazingly, Abigail Margaret DiGiorgio came forth from the womb on May 12th, 2004, just like Carolyn dreamed. It was absolutely amazing. And the details were incredible also. In the dream, I was standing there with her, and I was literally standing there with her as they were performing the C-section and took the little baby out, and I, I saw this little baby, just the, the life of my life. It was just incredible to see this little child. And some people would say, well, that was a coincidence. No, not, not at all. To us, it was a God incident. And why do you say that? Well, Abigail was born around 9 p.m. on May 12th, and Carolyn, when she came to, was still in a lot of pain, and doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. They did some things to her, but I want to say it was about not, no longer than a week that this pain was just excruciating, that I asked the doctor, please go in again and check it out to see if there's something else going on, because the baby's out, it's not the baby. So he was a little non-compliant at first, and we kind of forced the issue, and he performed surgery that night, a week later, in that hospital. It was a doctor that was specializing in that field, in that particular hospital. Coincidence? Yeah, not, not at all. When he opened her up and then sewed her back, her, Carolyn's OBGYN came back and said, if we had not done this, your wife would have been dead tomorrow, one day later. Coincidence? Absolutely not. It was a God incident. And it all started with a dream. God knew exactly what was going to take place. God knew exactly what was the underlying issue, not of the baby, but of Carolyn, what she was going through. Nobody knew this. Nobody could see it. But that baby had to come out in order for the surgery to be accomplished, and it had to be done in that time period, or else she would have died. Wow. God is incredible. And like I said, it all started with the dream. Job chapter 33 verse 14 says this, For God speaks time and time again, but a person may not notice it or recognize it. Think about that. God speaks time and time again, but a person may not notice or recognize it. God is always wanting to communicate with us, but we're too busy many times to hear, recognize Notice that it's God's voice. Job goes on in verse 15 of chapter 33. Sometimes he has to catch our attention when we are fast asleep. He says, he speaks, that's God speaks in dreams, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds. Wow, that's astounding. Sometimes 
God has to calm us down, get us to the point where we get to REM 4, and then, when all is calm, He then begins to speak into our spirit, into our heart, into our mind, and He begins to reveal certain things. Amazing. What was happened with my wife and the child was really a double blessing in that the child came out, Abby came out May 12th, but Carolyn's life was also spared. God had given us basically both a prophetic dream and what was going to happen, and yet there was something else underlying. Well, when we think about the Christmas season, there were a lot of dreams happening as well. As you may recall, Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel, told that she was going to bear Messiah, and Mary was astounded and looked at the angel and said, how is this going to be, saying, I've never known, never had sexual relations with a man. And the angel said, it's not going to be anything physical. It's going to be a spiritual thing that's going to take place. The God of creation, who creates individuals in the womb, he's able to do supernaturally also to create a child within the womb as well. And that which is going to be born in you is going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 speaks of it this way. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed when Mary, uh, when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph before they had sexual relations, it was discovered that she was pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Of course, being engaged, Joseph gets news of this, and he's a little troubled, as you can imagine. You know, he's assuming that she had an affair. He knows that the child is not his, and so he's perplexed. He's wondering how this is all happening. She's talking to him about an angel, and he's thinking, hmm, maybe she's lost a few marbles. You know, an angel coming, a supernatural visitation, impregnation supernaturally. Uh, yeah, okay, Mary. Yeah, you're, I think you're not, you know, I, I think you need to get seen by a doctor or something like that. You can imagine all the, the struggles that he's going through. And on top of that, if a woman was discovered who was engaged to have had an, an affair, or, you know, committed adultery, had a child by another person, that was grounds for stoning. So Joseph, uh, we read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, and Joseph, her promised husband-to-be, who always did what was right, not willing to make her a public example, Resolved to break the engagement privately. You can imagine, he's having all these thoughts. She's had an affair. Maybe she doesn't love me. She wanted to be with another guy. This is the end result. I'm going to try to do what's right. I don't want her to be stoned. So uh, I'm going to divorce her or break the engagement. And I'm going to do it privately so that nobody knows. This is everything that's going on in his head. And then God has to communicate to Joseph because he can't get Joseph's attention. Joseph's too busy. God's trying to speak. And Joseph is just busy thinking, having his own thoughts. What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 20, uh, 1, verses 20 and 21. Joseph had this in mind to divorce her. When an angel of the Lord appeared to him in his sleep in a dream and said Joseph descendant of David stop being afraid to take Mary to your wife because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins God had to intervene to set the record straight I want to say that one more time. God had to intervene to set the record straight. Joseph was dealing with a lot of issues, like I said. He realized that he was not the father. There were a lot of things going through his mind. But when he finally quiets down, God intervenes. God gets in and says, Joseph, you've got it all wrong. You know, you're looking at Mary, and you're assuming that because she's pregnant, you're assuming that she had an affair. But I've come to set the record straight. I have to tell you that uh, you're all wrong. Joseph, you know that a woman is going to give birth to Messiah, according to Genesis 3.15. And you know 
that the woman, the virgin, is going to give forth a child supernaturally, as Isaiah 7, 14 is explained. You know all these things. This is how God was communicating to Joseph through a dream. Joseph woke up, and he did exactly as the angel of the Lord instructed him to do. And see, the beautiful thing about this is that Joseph was going to have a part in this as well. When he got over his egotism and all the other stuff, God says, and you, you shall name him Jesus. You're going to have a part in this as well, Joseph. Well, I don't know about you, but like Joseph, you and I can sometimes have wrong concepts of the people closest to us. We can assume certain thing about things about people that we're closest to. We can think that they're one way, when in essence they might be the very opposite. We could judge people, and I don't know about you, but some pastors, and not me of course, but some pastors, they've told me that some people are so judgmental toward them that they assume so many things about who these pastors are. Oh, you know, they're this way and they're that way and they're judgmental and they're creepy and they're this and all this other kind of stuff. When in fact, they're really not at all. But it's not just pastors, it's all of us. You and I can look at our brothers and sisters and think things that we ought not to think. And that's what God is trying to communicate here. He's got to sometimes come down and set the record straight because we're so preoccupied with our thoughts thinking that way about the person, that sometimes God has to wait until we fall asleep to set the record straight and say, listen, this is my child too. They're born again just like you're born again. They've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in them just like you have the Holy Spirit. But I'm doing something in your life that you don't comprehend or understand. So lay off. Get it right. And this is the kicker. When we start loving each other, and when we start forgiving each other, when we start working together with one another, like Joseph and Mary, we become a powerhouse team. And then we can start proclaiming together, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Savior. We can start bringing and causing damage to the kingdom of darkness. The devil doesn't want us to come together. The devil wants to separate us. He wants to have us think about those th thoughts that he's putting in our heads about that other person. But like Joseph, we've got to have a visitation from God and for God to set the record straight. I hope you can say amen to that. Amen. The second time or reason why God will send a dream is to show us the best path or course to take. You remember that after Jesus was born, some wise men came from the east and traveled to Jerusalem to meet with King Herod. And when they got there, they asked, well, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star, and we have come to worship him, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. They come to Herod. Herod, where, where is this child, this newborn king? In Matthew chapter 2, verses 2 through 8, we read, When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Why was he disturbed? because he was a little bit of a psychopath. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they responded, because this is what is written in the prophet. Verse 7, Then King Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, Come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Do you think that was Herod's true intentions? Absolutely not. Herod was a ruthless king. He executed his wife when he suspected she was plotting against him. Suspected that she was conspiring against him. Three of his sons, another wife, and his mother-in-law met the same fate when they too were suspected of conspiracy. This is what this guy does to his family. Wow! Matthew's later account of Herod slaughtering the infants in Bethlehem fits well with what we know of the king's ambition, paranoia, and cruelty. That's found in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. Somebody said Herod was a strange mix of a clever and efficient ruler and a cruel tyrant. 
Herod had no desire for them to come back and tell uh, you know, them where Messiah was so that he can go and worship Jesus. No, no. He wanted the locale so that he could send armies over there to slaughter the child. And that's, in fact, what happened later on. So the Magi didn't know that, though, did they? They departed from there. They went to Bethlehem. They found the child. They worshipped the child. They left gifts for the child. And then God had to communicate to them, though, Herod's intention. And how does he do it? Well, Matthew chapter 2, verse 12. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Hallelujah. They departed by another way. Having been warned by God in a dream, they departed another way. Sometimes you and I get confused. We don't know which way to go. Sometimes we're on the right path. We're worshiping the Lord. We're offering gifts to Him. Yet, we're not really knowledgeable of the fact that there is an invisible enemy out there to steal, kill, and destroy. Like a roaring lion, he's wanting to devour us. See, he wants to destroy us. He wants to kill us. And we don't see that, though. But the gracious hand of the Lord intervenes and helps us. You know, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a right way that appears, or there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end... It only leads to death. You see, even righteous, born-again believers like the Magi, they were just trying to do what was right. Joseph was a righteous man. Remember, he, he messed up in his thought life. This is These guys are messing up in their travel. They're not really understanding the journey that they should take. And we, we mess up because we think everything is good, that we're not really fighting an enemy. Sometimes we put Satan aside thinking he doesn't exist. And we look at individuals... And we do the opposite of what Paul says when he says we don't wage war against flesh and blood. We wage war against flesh and blood, not realizing that there is a, an enemy out there, principalities, powers that want to bring us down. And sometimes God will help us by bringing dreams. I love this in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, how God takes control of our steps. Listen to this. Jeremiah said, I know, Lord, that a person's way of life is not his own. No one who walks determines his own steps. Listen, I don't know about you. Some people say, oh, you're, that makes you a robot. You know what? I would rather be controlled by the Holy Spirit, rather be controlled by God, knowing that he's ordering my steps according to his word. And yes, I would rather be allowing him to, to take control of my life so that at the end, when I stand before him, and when you stand before him, we can hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful serving. Proverbs 16, 9 says, we can make our own plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Psalms 37, 23, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. He guards the steps of the faithful ones. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. Praise the Lord. Thank God he is in charge of our steps. Thank God he is in charge of where we are going. Thank God that he takes control when we give our lives to the Lord. When we say, Lord, I, I can't do this. Take over. Save me. When he comes in and saves us, we give him absolute control. He takes control. And sometimes, listen, we're not always led by the Holy Spirit. We're led by the flesh and we go on a different path. And maybe it's those times that God will send us a dream to tell us the best path to take. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to close with this. You remember another Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph was a dreamer. Remember? The Joseph with the coat of many colors that his father had given him. Well, he had dreams as well. And one dream in Genesis 37 verse 9, he, he said that he was the sun, and the, or rather the sun, the moons, and the star were bowing down to him. And now the whole family understood that as they were going to bow down to Joseph. And they thought, that's ridiculous. Genesis 37, 5 says, One night Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. This was a result. Joseph, I believe, was just sharing something. He was probably too young to really comprehend or understand what this all meant and the fullness of it. But his brothers, who were older, they get angry at him. And what do they do? Well, you know the story. 
Joseph went and checked on his brothers one day, and as he came up there, his brothers plotted against him. So they threw him in, a, in an empty well in a ditch. They ripped off that beautiful coat that his father had made. They took a, an animal, slew it, and then put blood on this coat and then brought it back to Jacob, their father, and said, your son, your son's dead. But that wasn't all. They sold, they sold him into slavery. And after Joseph was sold to the Midianites, he was taken to Egypt and then sold to the captain of the guard named Potiphar as a household slave. You know the story. And Joseph was later falsely accused of tempting to rape Potiphar's wife, and then he was thrown in prison. Now I want you to imagine this young boy, this young man, he has this dream. He sees the future. God is showing him the future through this dream. And yet the future is looking very dim. It's not looking good at all. And he's probably losing hope. He's in that prison. And some other guys have dreams. And he interprets those dreams. And those guys end up getting out, or one does. And uh, the cupbearer ends up working for Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh has a dream, a very horrifying dream. And then, years later, the, the man remembers, Oh wait, there's somebody in prison named Joseph. He can interpret your dream. And Joseph then interprets the dream. He's brought out, interprets the dream. And because it was such a powerful interpretation, he was appointed a second in command over all Egypt, prime minister. So the dream that he had was fulfilled. Hallelujah. Joseph became prime minister. And in that dream that the Pharaoh had, there would be seven years that there would be leanness. Uh, I'm sorry, plenty. And then there would be seven years after that of leanness. So Joseph got in charge and he started putting food away, packing away, and it was a famine that affected not only Egypt, but all the lands, including the land where his brother, brothers and father lived. And his brothers realized that Egypt had a bunch of food, and they came and they stood before their brother. This is 20 years later, not even recognizing him, not knowing that it was him. And what they do? They had to bow down to Joseph. The dream was fulfilled. Friend, I don't know what dream God has placed inside your heart. I don't know what vision God has given you for your future. But the lesson here is that God will reveal sometimes what the future delineates, what it, what it has for you. He, he gives you an outline of what the future holds. Dreams are so very important, and it's God who's the dream maker. Listen, I'm not talking about eating pizza and having you know those kind of dreams. I'm talking about prophetic dreams. Like Carolyn had, May 12th, given birth to our little daughter. I'm talking about prophetic dreams that will warn you about what's going to happen. Set the record straight regarding your relationship with your brothers and sisters. I'm talking about dreams that will get you on the right course, take you on the right path. God will do that for you. God will sometimes give dreams to also show you what the future holds. So listen, this is the Christmas season and I want you to be open to God speaking to you. Just slow down. Allow the Holy Spirit to calm you. He, listen, He will come to you in a dream, but He wants to speak to you through the Word of God right now. He wants to speak to you, and I believe He's speaking to people right now that you need to just calm down, slow down. In the hurriedness of your life, just stop and allow the Holy Spirit. Job said God wants to communicate. God speaks time and time again. But we, the people, don't notice it. And that's why he sends the dreams and visions so that we can comprehend it. I hope this season you're going to be open to the dream maker and what he wants to put into your life and the dreams. He's got great dreams. These are God-sized dreams that he's placing inside of you. All right, amen. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the fact that you are the dream maker. And Lord, we're praying, help us to slow down. Help us Lord, to calm our spirits down. Help us to be aware of your speech, of your talking to us, Lord. We want to be open to it. And Father, I pray that you bless your people. Lord, I pray that this word would be something to encourage their hearts. Bless them, Lord God, as we go into this Christmas season. We thank you for being with us. We thank you that you are concerned about every detail of our lives. Thank you for ordering our steps, Lord, according to the promise of your word. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance on you, 
and the Lord grants you shalom in Jesus' name. God bless you richly, friends, in Jesus' name. Amen.